It's good to see you all. How are you all doing? Yeah. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. So I'm Robin, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, David and Heather are away enjoying a holiday and we're praying for them that they come back refreshed and rested. And it's good to see you all this morning. And we're continuing our series on pleasing God, looking at different aspects, different parts of the Bible that describe what it means to please God. And we've looked at pleasing God by faith, and we've looked at pleasing God by inviting his presence. And this week, we're looking at pleasing God by serving others. Pleasing God by serving others. And do you know, and see what kind of reaction this gets, that it is only 118 days till Christmas. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, the reason I'm sharing that, because it, it was December the, the 3rd, um, 2020, and obviously Christmas was just around the corner, and our uh, previous pastors, Willie and Jane Watt, were just packing up their stuff to head up. They were moving on, and we were in the search for, for new pastors for Harvest, and Jane and I were about to, to take over, and Christmas was coming up, and we were just getting ready for that. And then... Jenny decided that she would jump out of the loft and and really and break and sort of nearly break her ankle. So she was auditioning for her, her new career as a stunt woman, which hasn't really taken off <laughs> yet. So off in the ambulance, trip to Wishaw, and it flipped her all of her plans. If you think all the plans get up to Christmas and, and everything like that, were absolutely out of the window. And the reason I'm sharing that is because we experienced something of people's serving. Because people rallied round. We had, the boys were delighted, three boys, they all eat a lot. And, and people brought meals to the door. It was amazing. I put on about three stone during that time. And people sent encouraging messages. People were like, is there anything we can do? And helping out with the boys and helping out. And it was really, really a demonstration of what it felt like to be served, and it was absolutely amazing. And, I, and as well as that, I'm just I'm conscious as well that I'm speaking to a room of people who, who are all probably involved in many different ways in serving, either in church or in other parts of life. So it's an interesting topic to speak on, but I do believe that this, this is God's word. We know that there is new, it reveals new things to us. And, and I think, as Brandon said earlier on, we're moving into a season of life, you know, with, with everything that's going on and an average sort of fuel bill is expected to be around three and a half thousand pounds for people. We're moving into a season where I think God wants to really encourage us on this and encourage us to keep going. And, and, and for others, it may just be a reminder. It may be a reminder of gifts or ways that you can serve that you've almost maybe forgotten about. And then maybe for some it'll be an aha moment. They'll be like, okay, I can do this. I can get involved. This is something I can do. So I'm just going to pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that as, as we listen to your word this morning, that you would speak to our hearts and reveal to us ways that, that you would want us to respond to this message this morning, that we'd hear your voice in Jesus' name. So our text that we're going from this morning is in the book of the Bible, it's called Hebrews, and it's from chapter 13, uh, from verse 15. And it says this, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And that fits right into our topic of pleasing God, doesn't it? With such sacrifices, God is pleased. And I want to hang on for a minute onto that word sacrifices and not jump over it. Because a wee bit of context around that will probably be helpful. You know, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews, this is a part of the book, he's just kind of wrapping everything up and he's encouraging, he's sending, he's writing some encouragements to, to that group of, of believers. And, and these believers were coming most likely the majority of them coming from a, a Jewish background, people who had uh, followed the Jewish faith and then had come to faith in Jesus through that. And, and because of that, because of their religious background, their, much of their sort of 
religious experience had involved sacrifices in a very real way. You know, earlier on in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we, we see this practice of sacrifices coming in. The, the book of Leviticus is where a lot of that is detailed. And it, and it may seem a bit weird to us, but for the Israelites, it was, it was a powerful symbol of God's justice, i.e. him not leaving wrongdoing unpunished, and also a symbol of his grace, that, that something else was taking the punishment for us. And, and as well as that, there was different kinds of sacrifices. Some involved animals, some involved food, grain, oil, wine, that kind of thing. So this word sacrifice has got a real significance to the people that it was being written to. It, it was this sort of indication that they were, sacrifice for them was giving up something, giving up some material goods or possessions, even the, the cost of that or the time involved to prepare these different sacrifices of a commitment. And one thing we sometimes sort of skip over, we don't always see that, that one of the reasons for these sacrifices was actually God put them in place to, to help the people to draw near to him. These sacrifices were an act of dedication and submission where the people were able to give thanks and able to give gratitude to their God. And, and that's, that's what the sacrifices was all about. But what we know is that these sacrifices were insufficient you know, any sacrifices that were done had to be done again. You know, if there was a sacrifice for forgiveness of sins, then every every time that would have to be done again. It was temporary and it, was, it, it wasn't enough. And, and the Bible describes these sacrifices as a shadow of things to come. And we know that the shadow of things to come, that, that was pointing towards Jesus, who was going to lay down his life to be the perfect sacrifice once and for all. And that sacrifice was good for all time. And, and before the verses we read, the writer is he's describing all of this. And, and the reason I'm saying this in, in the context of this verse is when these Jewish believers came to faith, it left them with a question. It left them with a question, almost like, now what? What do we do now? You know, we, we don't have all these things anymore that we we can do, or that we, we are doing, because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that took away the sins of the world. You know, what, what is it that we can do now to show our gratitude and to please God? And that's where these verses come in, where it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So you get that. And there's two sacrifices mentioned. There's a sacrifice of praise. We're not going to talk about that this morning. We've got a series coming up and, and we're going to do a, a sort of a session on worship. Uh, so we'll talk about that as being God, as being a house of worship. We're going to focus in on what it means to do good and to share with others. Do good and share with others. I mean, how, how hard can that be? Eh? How hard can that be? So I'm not going to try and overcomplicate it this morning, but I do... I think it would be really good to dig into it a bit deeper and see what God is saying. And we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at we're going to look at how we please God by serving others. First of all, by considering our motives. Secondly, by considering the possibilities. And thirdly, by considering the servant king. So first of all, we consider our motives. If we're looking to, to serve, if we're looking to do that, we need to check in with our motivation. And then Pastor David, introducing this series, he shared a slide which will come up behind me. And he, he said this phrase, which I think is really great to hang on to when we're thinking about this. He said, pleasing God is not for his approval, but it's from his approval. So everything we do, including serving others, we need to get that the right way around. You know, when Jesus was baptised at the very start of his ministry and he was coming out of the water, the voice came from God and he said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This was before Jesus had even done anything. He, he, he hadn't even really got going with his, his active ministry. And, and God was affirming his identity, affirming the status of his relationship. And, that, and, and, and then Jesus followed on his ministry. We have to operate out of a place 
where we're operating out of our relationship and what God has done for us. We're not looking to earn his approval. We're not aiming to appease or, or manipulate God in some way to get what we want. It's not like karma. If we do some good stuff, then good stuff will happen to us. That's not how this works. And it's not about people pleasing either. People pleasing is out in this regard to serving. You know, actually people pleasing in a, a sort of convoluted way is self-serving. We're actually looking to please people so that they will think well of us and will treat us in a certain way. Paul said this when he was writing a letter. He said, am I, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And that's a challenge, isn't it? People pleasing is always something I've got to watch myself because I like to keep make everybody happy. And, uh, and I've got to watch my motives on that. And, and, and it's, it's, for me, it is an order to this. And the, and the most helpful verse that I found recently uh, was when Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica. And he says this, he says, We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love that because it just, it gets the order right. Your work produced by faith, your labour produced by love, your endurance inspired by the hope on our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're getting the fact that there's a right order here. There's a right order to this. And if we're looking for some clues to what might be driving our service, you know, it's if we're if we're checking ourselves, I found a really handy sort of section. I don't has, has anybody read the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster? If if you haven't, I really do recommend it. Probably doesn't roll off the shelves because it's got the word discipline in it, and it's like, oh no, discipline. But this this is a book that honestly, if you read it, there's such good stuff in it, it'll inspire you with a lot of these things. And he, he takes a chapter on service and he talks about distinguishing the different types of service. And he said, well, self-righteous service is purely via human effort, but true service comes out of our divine relationship. Self-righteous service likes the big deal. It likes the big deal, the big show. It likes to look impressive. But true service welcomes all opportunities to serve, whether they're big or whether they're small. Self-righteous service almost seeks external awards, the, the applause, the, the sense that, that something good might happen to them as a result. But true service is low key, it's low profile. It's satisfied that divine approval is enough. Self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve, sometimes depending on you know, how it's going to make you look, if it's going to make you look good to serve this person or that person. Self-righteous service can focus in on that, but true service is indiscriminate. It's indiscriminate. And he goes on and there's more and there's more. I do recommend it, recommend it reading. But of course we think, well, we've got to live as human beings. We can't be checking our motives every time we go to do something. It's quite a tricky thing to do. We are all going about our day to day. You know, and I always think, well, at the end of the day, if you've got a chance to do something good, you're not 100% sure of your motives, then it's probably good just to do the good thing anyway. But I think when we're thinking about this, it comes down to an issue of fueling. It comes down to an issue of filling our tank with the good stuff. Because if we're setting our time aside to be with God and, and we're spending time thinking about what he's done and out of that is flowing thankfulness, out of that is flowing gratitude, then that is going to be the fuel that will power the things that we're going to do. And that will produce the good stuff, it will produce fruit, it will produce life. And it talks about Old Testament sacrifices being a pleasing aroma to God, doesn't it? And I think when we do do things with the right motives and that gives off something that people maybe can't even detect but is the aroma of God. You know, if we've got good fuel, that aroma will be good. And I think of my friend Garth, who converted his car to run, uh, instead of run with diesel, to run with vegetable oil. And he used to get all, go around all the chip shops and get vegetable oil from the chip shops. And he used to strain the vegetable oil through old pairs of jeans to get all the bits of chips out of it. And he converted his car to run it 
And we had to drive behind cars on the way to a wedding because he knew the way to wherever the place was. And honestly, you could smell the fuel that he was using. It was like driving behind a chip shop. <laughs> and that's what I'm describing. When we, when we do things with the right motives, the, the, the smell of that to others, we might not even know it ourselves, is going to attract and draw people to God. It's going to attract and draw people to God. So that's the first point. We consider our motivations. Secondly, we consider the possibilities. And Brandon spoke about this at the start. We don't want to be all doom and gloom. We're speaking negatively over, over our country, over our land. But, but there is a reality. You know, there, there are facts out there that we can't ignore. Um, you know, it used to be you watch the news and it was usually something, even at the end, it would, you know, put something funny at the end, like a donkey parachuting or something, and a story about that. But the news these days is pretty, pretty bleak when we turn it on. And we're thankful, aren't we? I mean, we, we have the hope that we have. Imagine not having the hope that we have, that this world that we live in is not all there is. You know, but we, we need to think about others who don't have that perspective. So, here's some facts. Here's some facts, just to kind of give us a flavour. Mental health. Mental health, we know, is a major health challenge in Scotland. It says around one in three people are estimated to be affected by mental illness in any one year. And the problems are greater in areas of deprivation. That's just a fact. Young people's mental health. Um, in 2018, NHS Scotland published a briefing on health impacts and health inequalities linked to child poverty in Scotland. It highlighted that children aged 4 to 14 in Scotland's lowest income households were four times as likely to have poorer mental well-being than those in the highest income households. Sorry. Life expectancy. Between 2018 and 2020, the average male life expectancy was 60.9 years, while it was 61.8 years for females. Healthy life expectancy has decreased each of the last four years for females and the last three years for males. The report also shows that those living in the most deprived communities spend an average of 24 years fewer in good health than those living in the least deprived areas. What about those stats? I mean, they're incredible. They're incredible. Absolutely incredible. And we know that we live in a world in need. But we also know that everybody's life, all the people we meet, all the people we encounter, all the people we see when we're driving down the street, standing at the bus stop, all of those people's lives are better with Jesus. And Jesus came into the world and, and, and right at the start of his ministry he announced his manifesto. We're used to hearing manifestos of promises from politicians, but Jesus announced his manifesto and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed for free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's. All intertwined. We talk about spiritual, we talk about practical, but it's all wrapped up. Practical stuff is spiritual if it's done from the right heart and motives. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind and he opened the eyes of the spiritual. Spiritually blind, he, he, he fed the hungry with food, but he also fed the spiritually hungry. He healed the sick and also the spiritually sick. It's all together, it's all wrapped up. So what we see outside and what we see as we travel about is that there's huge possibilities. And, and it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming to look at that and think, what on earth do I do about this? What on earth do I do? Well, here's some suggestions. You, you can take some of these on board, whatever ones stick. Start where you are. Start where you are. Your work, your home, your community. If you're starting uni, you'll have opportunities. If you're retired, you'll have opportunities. If you're a new mum, you'll have opportunities. If you've just moved house to a new place, Start where you are. God has placed you in different places and he has a purpose for you. You can have an influence in those places for him. Also, what's in your hand? That's what, what's, that's what God said to Moses, wasn't it? He had his staff in his hand. God said, what's in your hand and I will use that. The gifts, the abilities that God has given you, the passions and even the frustrations that you have, 
the things that are stirring your heart, you can drive that energy into something and helping somebody. You know, you can give from your finances or your resources if you have enough to do that and God has blessed you. But there's a commodity of time. You can spend time with people. We're in such a busy world and people need people to spend time with, to talk to, for people to listen. There's hospitality. We all have we all have a table, a kettle, a front door. We can invite people in. People don't mind if it's hoovered or not hoovered. They just want someone to chat to. We need to have a radar. I think we, if we went out into a week and we switched on a radar to the, the opportunities that are going on round about us, it could be anything that comes up. We need to be willing to look for it. We need to be willing to be interrupted by God. But there's possibilities here as well in church. There's lots of people who serve. And, and if you don't currently serve, please do come and ask and we can find a role for you. There's lots of things and it's a great place to try stuff and to learn stuff. And you're actually by involving and serving in church, you're building this place that is encouraging people, it's encouraging all of us and sending us out every week and people can come in. So this is something we're building together and there's great opportunities there. We've got the community out there, we've got people who have generously given donations for that and if you want to volunteer for that or your time or found out, anything about that, anything about that. And it's not just about cost as I've said. I saw a lovely, lovely thing the other day. It was the Arsenal footballer, Bukayo Saka. Arsenal footballer, multi-millionaire, plays every week for Arsenal, had received racist abuse. And, you know, as, as sadly some people have experienced. And this wee boy had sent him a letter to say sorry for what he'd gone through and sent him his pocket money. The wee boy sent him his pocket money. What an awesome thing to do, isn't it? And, and it wasn't about the amount of money, it was the gesture. If you think of the heart of it, there are so many things that we can do. So many things that we can do. And there's so many benefits of serving as well. You know, because God, God puts in serving to change us. He puts in serving to transform us. It's, it's, if we serve, it stops us becoming inward looking, doesn't it? You know, if we're looking out for other people, it forces us away just from looking at our own needs and our own desires, and that's so important. But there is one more thing, because I know that we are all good-hearted people and we want to do lots of things. But I would encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit on this, because you can't do everything. There are certain things that God has for you and certain things that God may not have for you, and we need to listen to that. We're in this for the long run. We can't burn ourselves out. So we need to use the Holy Spirit. Richard Foster says that discernment and obedience are the keys. Learning when to say no is important, so is learning to say yes. He says we need to learn the rhythm of the Holy Spirit so that our yes or no to cause of service will arise out of that harmony. You know, I used to work in the Mitchell Library and I used to have to walk up Socky Hall Street to the bus station and guaranteed every time you would walk up Socky Hall Street, something would be going on. Any time there'd be something going on. And a lot of times I would just have to focus and walk past it. But there are some days, some days, where God just won't let you walk past somebody. And those are the times where that's the Holy Spirit. When you just feel, I can't walk past this, I can't leave this, I have to do something about this. That, to me, for me, how I work is, a, is an indication that the Holy Spirit is guiding me towards that. So, we've considered the motives. We've considered the possibilities that are out there. Last of all, we consider the servant king. You know, we look at Jesus' life and, and it's just an example of servanthood. You know, he, and how he lived, he ate with people, he celebrated with people, he grieved with people, he lived life, he gave time, he gave energy. And, and, and ultimately we know the path that he took to laying down his life. And, and, and we also look at who he served. He, he served a range of people, he served the most marginalised, the outcasts. But he also served the rich, the wealthy members of society too. He was indiscriminate. And if we're to reread any of the Gospels of the New Testament with the words 
servant king in our mind, I think we would see a whole fresh new realm of things in terms of how Jesus did stuff. And then we look at the disciples. And the disciples wanted to be great, weren't they? They were always arguing about who, who wanted to be the greatest. And Jesus ultimately redefined greatness by the way he lived and the way he served. And he almost said to his disciples, if you want to be great, if you want to be great in the kingdom, then this is all about service. And he showed it with his actions. He showed it with how he lived his life. And so, we're nearly there. But we're going to do something a wee bit different this morning because rather than we talk more about considering Jesus, we're going to move in and share communion together this morning. We're going to come and have that time where we do consciously remember and consider the servant king. And then if you're watching online, we'll skip this bit and you can come and join us in the end. So there we are. We're done. We've had our three points. We've listened to what God is saying to us. And it's over to us. And if there is one simple prayer, one simple prayer that we can ask each day, and this is not my own, I got this out of the book, it's this. It says, Lord Jesus, as it would please you, would you please bring me someone today who I can serve? Are you brave enough to pray that this week? And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And I look forward to hearing all about it.